They are a Silicon Valley law firm working with startups at every stage of the journey. My name is Denise Cardozo and I am the executive director of Silicon Valley Forum. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with Silicon Valley Forum, I'll just give you a brief flip about our organization. We are a 38 year old nonprofit organization supporting the global startup and technology ecosystem. So what that means is we create content and organize over 50 programs and events per year, including boot camps, conferences, panel discussions, pitch events, office hours, and immersion programs, and really so much more. Um, I encourage you to visit our website at siliconvalleyforum.com to check out all the other great initiatives that we are currently working on. I wanna thank you all for joining us today. And just a reminder that today's event is being recorded and everyone will remain muted throughout the duration of the program. However, we do encourage you to ask questions to our speakers throughout the talk by using the Q&A box located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can also follow the conversation on Twitter at SV Forum. So without further ado, please welcome our guest speakers from DocuSign. We have Robin Joy, a Senior Vice President and General Manager of Segment Marketing and Digital Sales. And joining her is Kim Peretti, Group Vice President of Customer Success. So Robin and Kim, I'm gonna let you take it from here. Thanks, Denise. Thanks, Denise. Appreciate you having us here today. I'll just give a quick bio of myself, very high level, and, um, and then I'll turn it over to Kim. And we thought that it would be um, a little more interactive for the audience if we sort of asked each other questions. So that's the format that we're gonna be um, using going forward. But um, just to, um, to start by introducing myself, um, as Denise mentioned, I'm Robin Joy. And I, have, I joined DocuSign back in 2012. So while we weren't a complete startup at that time, it was still early days. We had about 150 employees um, and we've since grown to 5,600 employees. Um, and uh, the, uh, the year before I joined, I think our annual revenue was about $30 million and we're up to uh, 1.5 billion um, uh, from our last, uh, last fiscal year. So it's been a really exciting journey and certainly having a customer centric mindset has been really critical to, to our success. And so look forward to sharing some of that with you. Um, in terms of uh, before DocuSign, I worked at a variety of different um, companies from startup uh, to Fortune 500, but one that particularly stands out with this topic in mind is Intuit. I was there for five years and I think of Intuit as um, having a lot of best practices as it relates to uh, customer centricity. So I'll make sure to share some examples from, uh, from my Intuit days as well. Um, Kim, I'll turn it over to you to introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks. Hi, I'm Kim Peretti and I am Group Vice President of Customer Success. Um, and really every day we wake up and our focus is on post-sale and making sure the customer experience and the customer outcome is really realized. And we're in a fortunate, I think, position in DocuSign where working with Robin, with our digital customers, all the way through the largest enterprise customers, making sure that every customer has a positive experience and derives value from the platform. So that's what we do. My experience, oh my gosh, I've been in Silicon Valley for a very long time. Uh, I got the opportunity to work with some of the best and brightest companies, obviously DocuSign, which is amazing, but also um, companies like PeopleSoft. And you know, through the years have learned just you know, what does make the best customer-centric, customer-focused um, organization, learning from some of the best and brightest. And I think what's interesting to note is as we talk a little bit about what we're doing at DocuSign, um, DocuSign is a people-first company. And I think as we get started, uh, we put our people first, our employees first, and that absolutely drives the focus on our customers. So while we'll talk a lot about customer centricity, um, behind all of that is a focus on culture and people, and that helps drive this, I think, in spades. It's really the engine that drives this. That's a great, um, a, a great addition because, of course, customers are people, and sometimes we can think <laughs> of them as uh, a, a little bit less human than that. But, but it, at the heart of it all, Kim, you're absolutely right that just getting focused on the human is very important. Right. So, Robin, let me start with uh, the first question. 
you've been at DocuSign, I think now it's almost nine, nine years. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how customer centricity um, has really influenced uh, and been infused in, in in the work that you do over the time you've been at uh, at DocuSign, I might start actually with our a story of our founding. Which, um, sorry, my dog is uh, wanting to participate in this conversation a bit. But um, in any event, I I think there's some really um, great customer centricity uh, to our early days and our founder Tom Gonzer. Um, he uh, he actually started DocuSign by thinking of there's got to be a better way. And uh, he was watching his wife with some real estate transactions and, um, and she, uh, she found that she really um, was just super frustrated with the agreement process. And part of how e-signature and DocuSign um, got evolved was because of that. Um, I, uh, I think it it's really goes back to the heart of this idea of customer centricity of looking and, and Kim, your earlier comment about the human nature is you really have to look at the individual um, and, and the problem, the pain point that that customer is having and, and then try to think of innovative solutions, which is absolutely how DocuSign uh, got started. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to, um, to a question for you, Kim. Um, how does the customer journey come into play when you think about being customer centric? I think we look outward first always at what is the experience going to be like for our customer at each phase and ultimately what would be the ideal experience that a customer would have at each phase, beginning with the end in mind, which is at the end of this, the customers purchase the product to derive value for an outcome they're trying to achieve, whether it's a problem they're trying to solve, a new opportunity, uh, whatever that particular outcome, use case and outcome is, and then backing into what would the experience be for that customer from the pre-sales process, which I know you're gonna talk a little bit about pre-sales and sales process, right through to once they've purchased, and then once they're with us for a period of time, how do we continue to cultivate the relationship and ensure that experience is really a very positive one ongoing? And then through really renewal and outcome um, to continue that journey. So it's really about what's the experience going to be like? How do we ensure um, that we deliver capabilities, services, and communications that will support that? And then I think ultimately, and I'll talk more about this later, is monitoring and measuring that along the way to ensure that in fact we are doing those things but it's really making sure that we define those experiences in the journey up front with an end in mind um, approach um that's great kim and as we think about a little bit earlier in the customer journey just you know it goes back when we think about the importance of customer centricity to really understanding in that case what we call the prospect um, and so really understanding, you know, what is their pain point? What, what problems are they trying to solve? And how does our solution help solve those problems? What are the benefits that we can provide them? Um, what are some of the key things? So for example, with DocuSign eSignature, we, um, we know how important to our, to our customers it is that it's easy to use and secure and legally valid and making sure that we're thinking through how do we communicate that both in our um, marketing upfront so that they are intrigued and interested, but then also helping them answer their questions along their way and sort of understanding um, where they are in their journey. A lot of times um, they might be, be interested, but they wanna understand how does it work? And so we try to provide that with website content, but we also try to get them into the product itself. Uh, we, really have focused on having a great free trial experience so that um, customers can try it again, try it out themselves because that's what we learned that um, they want to get started quickly they want to see how it works they want to make sure it makes sense to them they're also very interested in understanding um, the experience that the recipient will have so um, if you have a product that you're working on or a service that um, isn't just used by one person but in our case it's you know it, it's used to um, communicate and um, and complete agreements with with other parties. So making sure they sort of understand that that whole experience as well. So those are some of the ways that we um, we think about that uh, customer centric um, approach early on is just by really understanding what are their pain points, 
what problems are they trying to solve and how can we um, best meet their needs both for the information they're looking for but also of course ultimately trying to solve that uh, that problem yeah um kim just sort of building on the um the customer journey um how do you use that journey um that model uh to help ensure your cust our customers are successful so I think it goes back to so if we think about the journey and the stages, I'm going to use one at one stage as an example, which is I think to some of your points, Robin, is the welcome. So the deal is closed and the customer is coming into the organization. Um, we're going to welcome them and we're going to get them started. And in some cases, it's very quick in our some of our smaller customers and can be quite complex and long term, a little bit longer in our, our larger customers. But regardless, we want to welcome them on. And for each segment um, in that, well, for each segment, customer segment that we have, we have key metrics for success. So we've identified a target based on you know, information we've learned about our most successful customers with the best experiences and outcomes. And we've said, let's set these targets. These are best in class targets for people to get welcomed, onboarded, and starting using the product, which will help them derive value. And we benchmark against those on a regular basis to make sure our customers are achieving those. And where they're not, we know that something in the experience may not have gone as planned and will remediate. So it's really important, I think, to use those stages to define success metrics for the customer, to define uh, experience measures. So surveying how their experience is going, understanding what those are, remediating where necessary um, and ensuring that you're keeping on top of the experience the customer's having. Ultimately, so as they get onboarded and work to move to the next stage, they're really starting to optimize the solution for whatever business um, problem or opportunity they're trying to solve. So that's how we keep ourselves, um, ourselves grounded in terms of um, the, the customer outcome. Use the journey, define the success criteria and experience you want to um, have happen, and then ensure that you're monitoring, measuring that proactively and remediating as you go. That makes a lot of sense. Yes. So, um, you know, that being said, we talk a lot about measuring, monitoring. Um, we also spend, you and I, a lot of time understanding our customers. Uh, what role uh, does research play in our, um, in our customer-centric focus in terms of how are we using research? And I know you do a great deal of it, I think, more than I do. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. And um, for those who are listening, um, who, you know, you're at all different stages and early on, you may not have the budget to do big research studies. And so one of the things I love about as you think about um, customer research is it really can mean a wide variety of things. You know, the example I gave of how DocuSign was founded was really about our founder taking a look at a, a process that his wife was going through. And uh, his research was essentially a one-on-one, -on -one, what we might call, um, uh, with her. Obviously, you want to be careful when you're doing one-on-ones. You, you can get, um, you need to make sure there's a broader market opportunity um, than, than just with that one person. But, uh, but I think it can it is so important to talk to customers. And so sometimes that is in the form of a one-on-one, -on -one. sometimes that's an informal one-on-one, -on -one. sometimes it's a very structured um, uh, uh, research process that you bring in an outside research firm to help with. Um, sometimes it means um, uh, doing a larger quantitative study. So we do, um, we do research, for example, to measure brand awareness and understand um, our customers and our competitors, but we also do it to understand things like our, um, our opportunities with our customers um, that where we might be able to introduce a new offering or new features um, or, um, and again, as I talked about earlier, um, when we think about messaging, understanding what are the key benefits um, that are important to address. And so that can oftentimes be done in the forms of quantitative research. Um, there's also a lot of user experience research that's done. And again, that's done in a variety of different ways. Um, our product team does a lot of that user experience research themselves. Um, we also sometimes use tools um, to, uh, to put mock designs up in front of, of uh, people that they can see. And uh, of course, we also 
you know, I think of A-B testing as another example of uh, a form of research. So um, lots of different um, types of research at, um, at, at DocuSign that we do. And um, a lot of them are still relevant for a startup as well um, and don't have to require big budgets. The, um, another uh, technique that was used when I was at Intuit was a, a term that they called a follow me home. And it would be a little bit difficult to do these days when um, most of us aren't letting a lot of people into our homes. But, um, and, but at that time, uh, we would actually go to somebody's um, home or office and observe them in their environment, which is a really powerful way so that you can actually watch how someone's working. And um, it, it allows them you to be really clear that this is actually um, not just what they're telling you that they do, or tell, but that you're actually watching, watching them in action and seeing sort of some of the opportunities as a result of that. Um, so lots of ways to get creative to, um, to do research with prospects and customers. Um, Kim, I'm going to ask you a question now. Um, as you think about designing a positive customer experience, like what's what's sort of going, how do you use data and insights to to measure whether customers are having a positive experience? Yeah, I think one of the first things we learned is um, to test and verify what the experience is like as we've been building out these various programs. So I think first and foremost, we we build a framework of what is it you know, the what and the why. Um, what do we want the customer experience to be and why? What is the outcome both for them and for us as a business that we're trying to achieve? Then what we do is we run that with what we call leading and lagging indicators of success. So what are some initial, because some of these programs can take a while in terms of understanding in, in bulk, you know, with a number of customers, really what the, what the um, you know, what the conditions are. And so we have leading and lagging indicators. And so we'll run the program typically in a proof of concept to start. We'll, we'll establish some targets. And sometimes that's a hypothesis. Um, and we'll keep those pretty straightforward. So one of the things that I would say is that you can get really down in the weeds with wanting to measure everything in terms of what was the experience like. We we'll get really deliberate on some key um, focus areas. We pressure test that in a proof of concept. We then take a look at the data and start to look at what the data is telling us about that customer experience. And that can come in a, in, in a multiple of way, in a, a multitude of ways. One is it can be, you know, what was the initial engagement of our customers against perhaps a campaign we were running that provided them with information about resources available to them as an example? Who did we have engage from there? You know, once they engaged, did they access the resources? And then what we might do is with that cohort, follow up and say, were those resources valuable um, and get immediate customer impact? And we'll look at that against really what happened to the customer and those lagging indicators in terms of, did the condition for the customer change in terms of whether it was something regarding, um, you know, how to get value from additional feature use or um, attending a particular event we were running or whatever, whatever it is that was the call to action. Did we create an environment and an experience for them to then engage in a way that was positive? And we'll do that both with direct customer feedback, but also by behavioral feedback, um, we'll get from both product telemetry as well as other indicators. So those are the things that really help us understand. Um, and then we do do some outreach. We do direct outreach uh, to our customers to hear firsthand um, what, what are these experiences like for you? And we take those back and we fold those in um, a, less scientifically and more anecdotally, um, particularly in the POC, in the proof of concept. Hey, Kim, I'm realizing there's a question here from um, Irene in the audience, and I'm just going to read it out loud. I'm not sure whether it should, um, you or, or I can take it, but um, are you, as you're talking about research and data, what measurements are you regularly tracking based on the data you have? I'm particularly interested if you're tracking costs to retain customers across different use case segments. I think that's a question for you. Yeah, um, I wouldn't say that that's a key metric that I'm, I'm, I'm monitoring right now. What I am monitoring is from a metrics perspective is, did I create an environment where the customer is engaging? So if my cohort was 5,000 customers and I got 100 of them to engage, something 
that experience did not invite the customer in first and foremost. One of the, an, another, uh, I think another um, metric is, okay, so once they were engaged, what was the behavior or the activity level? And then what was their experience with that particular experience or activity uh, call to action? And then finally, we're measuring the correlation between what we do from an experience perspective, the resources we provide, the engagement we provide, and the overall simplicity, um, hopefully, of them working with us and it being a really direct and, and positive experience, what effect does that have as a subscription business on our renewal and upsell and cross-sell opportunities, which are some of those lagging indicators I was talking about. So we're really right now focused on what was the experience like and did that experience really drive an outcome both for the customer and for DocuSign? Um, thanks, Kim. And the, uh, you know, on the product side, our team also focuses a lot on um, net promoter score. And so, um, thinking about, um, you know, is it is this product something that you would recommend to a friend? Oftentimes, that that language is seen as yeah. um, language that is really helpful to understand, um, not just whether people were satisfied with this specific experience, but whether or not they were actually um, uh, essentially promoters, or whether they were so thrilled by the experience or so wowed by it that they would um, recommend it to someone else, which is. Um, something, of course, we all aspire to uh, to have, and um, and we're fortunate with our uh, DocuSigny signature to have a really strong um, net promoter score, and that does help a lot with the potential um, for virality in the business, which is great. Yeah. Um, anything else you'd add around customer SAT or um, or MPS? I know there's also customer SAT that we use sometimes yeah. in our customer support teams too, in a little bit of a different way than MPS. Yeah, and I see the customer sat, Robin, to that point. Customer sat's almost a ladder. We have multiple customer satisfaction um, touch points. And then ultimately the net promoter, which really gives us an indication of um, how customers are feeling about working with DocuSign. And I think we take all of that in um, and, and, and leverage that in totality. So I think we've got a good cross section um, with our ability to then, I think, instrument in different areas with the customer satisfaction surveys. And then I think in totality or in a, in a holistic way, use that net promoter to understand across DocuSign how, how our customers are feeling about us and, and what their experience is like with us and with our product. And ultimately um, that they're really getting the value and they're having the experience while doing that um, in a positive way. So Robin, let me ask you, um, what tools are you using to develop customer insights? So we use a lot of tools. Sometimes, um, uh, you know, we, we joke about the number of different tools we use, but, um, but there are a lot of great tools out there and they're not all um, uh, that expensive. So um, we use, for example, um, for our quantitative research, um, we are uh, oftentimes doing that with our partner Qualtrics. Um, we also use SurveyMonkey. Um, we do, um, for our A-B testing, we'll be, we use Optimizely. Um, we, I, I'm a fan of usertesting.com for when you wanna do a, a sort of some user experience testing, it particularly works well for the SMB segment because um, they do have a lot of small businesses on their, um, on their platform. Uh, and then we also, uh, you know, have some other research vendors that we that we partner with um, as well. Um, and Kim, I'll ask the question back to you. Are there any that um, that you call out that uh, that you would want to mention? I think we use the, you know, we use the same as well. I think right now um, we're doing a lot of work, uh, as you know, on voice of the customer and um, Qualtrics is 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 um, where we're leaning in there with our with our teams. Um, so that's probably a primary, um, but yeah, all this, all, all of the same and a lot of that same AB testing that we do with Optimizely as well, so. And, yeah. and I would just also add that um, there are actually really great ways to, to essentially get these customer insights using um, uh, it, not necessarily research tools, but um, for example, if you have a product or a website that has a chat functionality, um, 
uh, reading through those chats and understanding, even if you know if you're not the one answering yeah. them, but if you have a chance to go through them, you can actually get some real good insight into what types of um, questions your prospects and customers have, and um, really use that to try to help help solve those. Um, questions in ways that they don't have to be asked via chat, whether that means um, more improving the clarity of your marketing or improving um, your support content. Um, sometimes it means actually making some changes to the product itself. Um, so, uh, so research tools can be, um, you know, really leveraging other types of tools like um, making sure you're understanding the, the conversations that are happening um, through chat and email. Yeah, agreed, agreed. I, I was gonna say too, we learn a great deal in the success organization from what's coming through our support organization as well. So customers do call because they're trying to maybe solve an issue, uh, a technology issue, but there is a wealth of information in your support team uh, that goes well beyond just technical break fix. And I would, I would say, uh, you know, it's something we leverage in understanding the customer experience is really part of that. So it comes from multiple sources too um, within your organization. So Robin, let me ask, um, uh, let me ask you another, another question, if I may. Um, where's an example, I know you have several, by the way, uh, where you've leveraged a customer insight to drive an, a change or an innovation here at DocuSign? So one um, that uh, goes back a few years, but we were finding that um, as we were monitoring sort of our trial experience and um, surveying our customers and understanding their adoption patterns, we found that there was a segment of our customers who were finding our trial hard to use. And it was an interesting thing because once you've actually used um, our product, it's actually um, very easy to think of it as, as very easy. And you forget your first start, you know, your first experience getting started. And so that's again, where it can be really valuable to, um, to leverage this insight. Because um, I know when we were first collecting this insight and went back to the product team to tell them that, um, you know, a segment of our prospects who were finding the trial hard to use, they were kind of surprised by it because they're like, oh, our trial is so easy. <laughs> um, but, uh, but fortunately, we, um, we sort of, you know, reviewed the, the uh, data together and, um, you know, sort of aligned on the insight. And then the um, really partnered with the design team and, and the product team on thinking through that first use experience and um, sort of updating some of the flows and user experience. And, um, you know, it made a, a really meaningful difference where we were able to drive up adoption of the trial, which, you know, for us means that they were able to successfully um, send out an agreement for signature. And, um, and also it drove an increased in, in conversion rates. So, um, so it's, it was a really helpful to have the, um, the data to back up the fact that we needed to do this work. And then it really, um, we did some other research along the way with, through that insight to make sure we were improving the, uh, the flow and the experience um, in a way that would be meaningful. And, um, and then of course, use data at the end to measure, uh, to measure the success of that initiative. So it was, um, it was a really important one, knowing how important ease of use is to our um, uh, customers and really helped us um, as we were looking to bring more and more people uh, to DocuSign. Yeah, and I think, you know, that first impression, right, that first foray in uh, is so critical to the long-term relationship. Um, Kim, there's another question from the audience, which I will um, ask and we can, yeah. Um, sort of answer together, but um, what are the basic stages for people considering starting a startup must go through that to have an MVP that customers will love? Um, so that's a big question, <laughs> um, but, um, but I love the idea, um, the, the MVP meaning minim, minimal viable product um, is certainly something, um, a really important concept in that you, um, especially when you're in the early stages of thinking about a, a new product, or a new feature, you want to uh, be able to get some insight on it before you've invested too much um, uh, time and money. So I will, um, I'll start the answer um, and Kim add on and, and share a different perspective as well. But um, 
from what I've seen sometimes is, you know, there are ways that you can, you first want to make sure, is this idea something that people will be interested in? And so there are actually some techniques that you can use to get insight before you've even built the product. Um, and so you might be able to, for example, um, uh, create a concept that's really even just on um, some flows that that aren't aren't fully built out that you could, you know, one of the tools I mentioned, um, uh, user testing, you can put something up on user testing and get some feedback when it doesn't have to be a live, it doesn't even have to be a live website, it can just be um, some some flows that mock people up through the experience. And so it depends, I guess the answer is, like many answers is it depends. Um, but but for the early stages, you want to make sure that the idea, the concept you have is appealing to people and that they understand what it is. Um, at some point, obviously, you actually have to have a product built so that um, you can also make sure that it's it's something that customers will, will use when it's a real product too. But there are some concept stages where uh, your MVP doesn't even have to be a live product. Right. Um, Kim, what would you add on to that? Yeah, I can remember probably four or five years ago, I was working with someone who that's exactly what they did. So they had done a business case and, and they had received some very positive feedback um, some, from some investors. But the investors said, you've got to go back out there and, and kind of vet how this would work. And they showed up to me with wireframes. So they didn't even have the product, but said, let me walk you through what this what we're envisioning. And that was really the first step. I think the next step is, okay, that goes well with enough people, you've got a good business case and you've vetted really how this is gonna operate uh, to start, what this is, what it's gonna do. I think the next step is to find a few core customers um, that you're willing to, uh, they're willing and you're willing to engage in what I would call an incubation and really run it through its paces. Um, and not be afraid um, uh, of, of the feedback. And I think that was one of the things I learned from this, this partner and now friend was um, I think tented, they were tentative about the feedback because nobody wants to have an ugly baby. Uh, but you really have to be willing to um, be vulnerable in terms of exposing what it is and also be open to once you get into the wireframing and the incubation. Um, uh, I think a mindset that that's probably going to iterate for a little while. And then I think if you really are open to that and, and lock in there, you're, you're that much more confident as you come out to really introduce that outside of the incubation period. Um, that's great. I love, I love it. The ugly baby. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, Sometimes no they one, can no. be. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, but um, but to your point, um, you never know until you put it out there. So uh, it also it also could be a beautiful one. Right. Um, Kim, um, one of the things I admire about you is the fact that not only do you have a customer centric mindset, but you really help instill it in your team. And I'd love to have you share with um, the audience. Um, they may not have as large of a team as you do, but it's still really important that you bring that um, that you help bring people along as you're building um, your company and and you know thinking about the team that you want to have around with you. Having that, how do you help Kim um, make sure that folks have everyone has that customer centric mindset? Well, I think first and foremost, as we talked about at the very beginning, is um, it starts with how you treat your employees and the culture of your organization. I think if those things are in place um, where um, you act as a servant leader with focus on your team, um, that, that first and foremost. I think secondly is a lot of uh, the work, uh, particularly as we're ideating, creating and strategizing is begin with the end in mind from a customer perspective. So sometimes people will come in with different approaches or programs or ideas and the first question I asked is, tell me what this would be like for the customer. How does this affect the customer? And I think that's now built into the DNA. I see it in my leaders and I see it in the, in the, um, the activities that um, our, our team members are doing. So it's just continually building that muscle and really coming from a customer perspective in, in really everything we do, whether that's a new product um, and you know what will the what will what and why would the product the customer want that 
but it can also be as mundane as if we change something operationally on the back end, what is that experience, even as mundane as like billing or, you know, writing a statement of work or what have you. So it's really not just about the, the product or a particular success service, but also um, when we change things internally, what kind of impact will that have um, in terms of a customer experience as well? So um, that's the dynamic on a regular basis. And over time, um, it just becomes part of, um, I think, how we operate, how we think. So um, that, that's how we do it. it it's really rigor. <laughs> Um, that that makes sense. And the other thing I would add um, that you know is to as you're helping to get our um, we're helping to get our teams into that customer centric mindset is to just make sure that we're really um, helping those who aren't frontline ex employees really get frontline exposure. And so in the early days, um, my team used to answer chats directly. And so again, that really forced them to understand what people's questions were and to develop customer empathy. Um, the follow me homes that I mentioned at Intuit also do that as well. Um, and, uh, you know, people could sign up to be part of that research um, and attend and even be a note taker if they weren't the interview candidate. Um, and uh, so, so there are definitely ways to help continue to infuse that mindset. Um, and it looks like we have um, dropped Kim for a minute, but it looks like you're back. I don't know what happened there. Uh, all the wonders of technology. Sorry about that. No, no problem at all. I was um, I was just building on um, developing a customer um, mindset and helping remind people that um, talking to customers and developing empathy for them is uh, is so important. So again, it does it starts oftentimes with yeah. with your actions. There, I remember. Um, you know, there are all kinds of examples of. Um, uh, executive programs, um, but also startup programs where you're talking, you're taking the support calls yourself. Um, you're, you're talking to people who are using the product and, um, and having, uh, you know, having questions so that you, again, develop that, that empathy directly. And I think uh, to that, to that point, Robin is, um, you know, we've had people even, you know, within our legal and operations team come sit in our on bar boarding team for the day and take calls with our onboarding specialists. Um, you know, from a DocuSign perspective, you see a lot of that um, engagement wanting to, well, to your point, they may not work with customers every day. Um, they are uh, embedding in our success teams, as an example, to understand the customer condition much more thoroughly. Um, Kim, I have another question um, yeah. for you that's from me, but then I'm also going to take a look because there are a few questions in the um, okay. Q&A as well. But, um, but uh, my um, last question for you is, um, you know, you talked about up front when you introduced yourself that we at DocuSign really have this benefit that we serve such a broad spectrum of customers um, for our e-signature product from sole proprietors all the way up to global enterprises. And with such a diverse range of customers um, who, um, and, and, and quite frankly to that question that came up earlier from one of the audience members, you know, not all of them are, are paying the same amount. Some of them are paying um, that much. How do, you, how do you bring a customer-centric approach to all of our customers, but also sort of be mindful of the fact that what we might yeah. be um, able to uh, afford to give or what, what even might, um, uh, what the customer might want at a sole proprietor level might be very different than what a global enterprise needs. Right, and I think that goes back. Some of that is um, due diligence and research on you know, understanding we have multiple customer segments and then also laying over that the need to scale because the, you know, obviously there are considerations in terms of how much um, you can give to every one of these customers. And then building out programmatically um, what we call at scale programs um, that really allow us to really engage, whether you are a sole proprietor, there are resources and, and uh, things available to you, um, or you're a Fortune 100 um, looking to do something much more extensive and, and involved. So there is a lot of um, time up front doing some of the things we talked about. 
and then mapping programs, capabilities, and resources um, that will be that makes sense for um, the type of organization we have and the types and variety of customers, so that ultimately every customer has something available to them to create a positive experience and for them to derive the value from the the product. But it is a segmentation um, exercise. It's leveraging data to create meaningful experiences. So at scale, um, one might think, okay, you send something out to tens of thousands of customers. Um, we actually look at the customer, we're looking at industry, we're looking at, um, you know, are they a customer who's been with us for a long time with maybe a higher maturity level or not? How many features are they using? And really trying to craft a meaningful experience based on a lot of different data points that really allow us to get to what the customer um, could find a value from us um, as they're working and engaging with us. That's great. Okay, so I'm. Um, there's a few different questions in the chat, so we'll try to um, get okay. through a few of them before we have to wrap up. Um, I can take the first one, which is, sure. um, uh, what are the best tools for developing prototypes for a product? And when I say I can take it, I'm not the expert on it. So if Kim, you have any more expertise, let me know. But one tool um, that I have used, um, uh, it, or my team has used is called Envision um, with an I. It's, uh, it's a great tool for when you have um, wireframes and want to sort of um, put them together as if it were a live flow. Uh, and then you can get, so it's helpful particularly for, I'd say, um, uh, user experience flows and marketing website or marketing um, purchase flows, those kinds of things. It's a great tool for that. Um, I'm sure there are many other prototyping tools out there that um, I may not be as familiar with, but Kim, others that you would mention? Uh, that is not my area of expertise, Robin. I think you have the better answer of the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so next one is um, for a startup with an extremely lean team, what should the founders focus on to get their first clients on board, assuming that the initial customer research has been conducted? Getting those customers to value and then becoming raving fans. So I think, you know, obviously you've got to find those first key customers. So, you know, sales. And I remember being in an incubation uh, workshop. Uh, with a, a couple of venture capitalists. And that was, there were two things that they said. One was, don't try to peanut butter all the positions, just try, you know, first and foremost, positioning value sale, and then making those first few customers extraordinarily successful and raving fans. And from there, that really starts to get you on a trajectory because you're going to use that to to, you're going to leverage that then to expand. So those are the two areas, finding and, and acquiring the customer and then making those customers really successful um, are, are, are the two most important. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, oftentimes early days, um, you, you may not be um, even charging people um, if you're really just trying to get their feedback as well, or at least you're going on a model where they might you know, you want to set them up, obviously, at some point, you, you need to get paid, but, um, and, and there is some benefit of them paying money, because they have more skin in the game. So, but sort of thinking of flexibly about the, um, the pricing model, uh, as, as well, as you've identified those customers, um, as you're really just trying to make sure you have product market fit. Um, One other thing is uh, the network. So as you're in those early stages and you're either in incubation, which may be free to your point, Robin, or right afterwards, maybe you're going to do something with pricing, but it's going to be flexible so you can acquire those customers, is um, do you have a network where you can work with someone in your network who would be willing to work with you in either the incubation or those early stages? Um, and so that's a really important piece, too, is where do you go and find the, the, the customers? And often these customers come through word of mouth and network. So I would say that's an important piece um, versus cold calling in to try and get somebody to try and work, you know, to work with a new company and to try a new product. Um, having that seal of approval from somebody that somebody else knows is invaluable. Um, okay, another question. Can you share some of your experiences with um, carving customer relationships? I understand you've both worked in huge teams with lots of people doing this, this smaller 
um, work like cold calling and sales development. Um, so I'm not sure if this question is talking about more like territory car carving for sales teams, um, which is a little bit different than um, uh, um, some of the other areas that we've been talking about, which is after you already have a customer. Um, I think that, um, you know, I'm not sure we'll probably go into that much depth, depth about something like a territory carving for a sales team, but um, Kim, as I read that question to you, is there anything that, um, well, yeah. you know, I have a large team, a, a large team now, but this team was not always large. Um, and what I will say is when, uh, so part of the success organization is really, you know, and still in, and I would consider, you know, earlier stages um, where there, it didn't exist before. So I just want to set that context because everything has to start from somewhere is when we were building out our customer success management organization, um, in terms of territory assignment and complexity around that, we tried, I think, to be very um, straightforward and simplistic to start with that, that territory assignment approach um, because we had a very mature sales organization. So I think starting simple um, is, is the best best approach if it's a smaller organization and you're not quite sure what this should look like yet, it's okay to say, I'm going to take this in a more simplistic way. I'm going to learn from that. And then maybe I'll carve these territories once I start to learn a little bit more, um, ideally getting to a, a, a steadier state. So you're not always carving or changing territories, but I think that's an important an important question and an important point is don't worry about carving and being scientific to start. Um, I think you actually have to learn if it's if it's earlier days. Um, thanks, Kim. Okay, another one is how do you regularly check in with customers to determine satisfaction and get feedback? Yeah, well, a couple of different ways. At the highest level, so in our enterprise business, uh, probably three to four times a week, if not more sometimes, like this week is a really big week. I'm in executive briefings, I'm in customer calls, I'm following up on a recent large implementation. Um, so there is consistent uh, regular live engagement with those customers um, together with my team to understand what was the experience like. And then there are check-ins with those same customers as they go live, they're adopting, optimizing, and, and starting to achieve some of those outcomes. At the, at the, um, at the, at the lower segments um, where we have from mom to pop to um, mid-market mid and so forth, where we have thousands and thousands of customers, um, we actually do do some spot checks. So we do do some spot checks there, but we also run, I think to earlier points, uh, customer satisfaction surveys, we're looking at our NPS scores um, and using all of that to better understand how our customers um, how our customers are doing. So it's a combination of high touch um, and, and, and hybrid, which is a little bit of high and a little bit of tech touch and then tech touch. Great, thank you. Um, and yes, uh, it definitely varies by segment, um, but we, we make sure to, um, at a minimum, give our customers an opportunity to respond to a survey, whether that's a net promoter survey or a more, more in-depth um, uh, survey on, yeah. um, uh, as, they're, as they're using the product and, um, and then on an, on an annual basis as well. Yeah, and I will tell you, um, I get a lot of uh, customer inquiries off of LinkedIn. Anyone who contact us and in contact, reaches out to contact me directly from a customer perspective via LinkedIn, I contact every one of them. I may not be able to address their need or question in myself, but I make sure that gets concierged to the right place. That's great, Kim. I uh, be careful of your uh, <laughs> of your. Uh, well, someone just LinkedIn, said that. But... Like at some point, Kim, are you? You know, is it just going to become too much? It hasn't yet, um, <laughs> and you know, it keeps it real. I think that's an important piece. Um, I'm on the ground a lot, and it's my favorite part of the job but it also keeps it very real. I think as we get further up in, um, in roles and, in, and in, as your organizations grow, it can be challenging, but I know best practices and talking to um, colleagues at other organizations as well is at, really at all, you know, as a priority is, is 
it is for me to be in the field, for our team to be in the field, working and understanding the customer condition to ensure that that customer experience is outstanding. So uh, you can feel yourself moving away from that. I would say if nothing else from this conversation is how do you continue to stay engaged and understand the customer condition, customer experience, uh, regardless of, of how large you grow? Great. Um, the next question I'm going to take isn't necessarily specific to customer centric mindsets, but I'm I'll take a stab at it. It says, um, what's better for young people with little experience building a product or startup? Is it venture capital funds, angel investor groups, or um, business incubators? Um, and I think that um, the answer is it depends. Um, so <laughs> it's hard, it's hard to generalize. Um, and, uh, um, and the um, you know there are business incubators that I think can be really valuable for people, particularly if they're um, may not already have a network, because I think that those business incubators are set up to provide some support and guidance. That's probably um, uh, particularly valuable uh, for um, people who, who don't have that network already built. Um, so that's certainly an avenue to explore. Um, you know, most, uh, most startups start with some seed money, which might be from a formal investor, angel investor group, or from just some individual um, people. Um, and so, you know, there are venture capital funds that specialize in seed, but you know, usually you have to be a little bit further along for that. So I think um, I, uh, I'm i sure there's there's a lot much longer conversation, a whole session that could be on that topic, but I'll, um, I'll leave it at that for now. Um, and then uh, there's a question about, um, can I think we'll, well, this is a perfect one for us to, um, to close on. Could you summarize the most important steps or rules at the end? Um, and so we'll, we'll take this as our last question um, is a tee up for, for, um, for summarizing. Uh, and um, I don't know that either one of us would call it rules, um, but, but certainly in terms of, of steps, um, Kim, do you wanna take a, take a start and then I will uh, I'll add on? Sure, I, th I think there's a, a couple of things. I think first and foremost is you, you have a clear value proposition for your business, right? And that whatever it is you're um, putting forward, it's clear what it is and what opportunities or problems it will solve. And then it's really making sure that the experience for the customer, we're talking earlier about first impression, is in the sales cycle and pre-sales process, um, that that is a really extraordinary experience. And then ultimately, especially for us, I know I'll speak on, the, on, on behalf of subscription businesses, it's really making sure you've built a framework that engages with the customer through their life cycle in a way that creates opportunities that, for them to continue to find value from the product you've sold them. And uh, you know, for all the reasons you've positioned uh, the product um, upfront to do. So I, I, I can't emphasize that enough. I think what happens is we get really focused on selling and you have to, I, particularly for those of you that are starting up, you have to get the sales in and we're always focused on that. Once you get that up and running, I know for us, we're thinking about, we've got a large install base of customers um, that's critical to keep the experience um, and the value coming for those customers. So those are the two big things is making sure customers continue to have a positive experience post-sale and that they're achieving value from whatever it is you've sold them. Um, I, I, I think we can sometimes lose our way um, and once we sell it. And I think that's where I would double down is those experiences uh, post-sale. And, um, and the only thing I would add is just to always be curious. And so if you let kind of curiosity be your guide and think about, um, you know, is, is this, um, uh, where are people getting stuck? Where are people having questions? Where are people's pain points? Um, how can we solve those pain points? Um, you know, constantly keeping those kind of questions top of mind and then um, making sure that you're, um, engaging in, in some ways with your, um, with your target customers, even, even before you have customers. 
Um, and uh, and with that, I will. I see that um, Denise is is back on the screen and um, and is joining us to wrap up. I know we're at time. Um, uh, we enjoyed being here, so thanks for having us. So much. Bob and Kim, thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise. We actually dropped some really, really great gems here. There's certainly a lot to unpack and we'll be, we will be sending the link to this program to all the participants to rewatch and references needed. And of course, I wanna thank our wonderful partners at Hopkins and Carly um, for making this, um, this whole series and this session possible. And thank you to all of our participants who joined us today. Our next program in this series is on May 27th, where we will discuss data privacy and protecting your startups. With that, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day and see you soon. Great, thank, thank you. you. Thank, you. Bye. thank you. Bye. Bye.